Hello, everybody, and welcome to the CNBC Pro special one-hour live stream event. We are here live at the Milken Global Conference, the 25th annual, by the way, in Beverly Hills, California. I am Brian Sullivan. Really appreciate you joining in, tuning in, and signing up for CNBC Pro. Thank you so much for being here. And what a critical time this is right now, and what a great lineup we've got over the next hour. It's only the second time we've ever done this kind of event, folks. So uh, you're going to ride along with us, and we've got four big brains, great ideas, great guests. We've got an economy that looks to be rolling over a bit. We've got a stock market that has been struggling. We've got a bond market that is shifting faster than any time in the last decade at least. And we're going to get some insight into what exactly is happening and more importantly, how to navigate it and what to do. So for the next hour, you're going to ride along with us here on CNBC Pro. And this is live, unscripted. <laughs> And kind of off the cuff, and let's have a good time. And our first guest is just perfect, Elizabeth Burton, uh, the uh, retirement system of Hawaii, running their uh, their pension. Uh, Elizabeth, it's great to great to have you on. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for doing this. Uh, kind of a guinea pig type event, right? <laughs> yeah, Are you for ready? Sure. I, I don't know. We're, we're going to find out. <laughs> we're live right now at CNBC Pro. From your perch, and I know you're not you're not a stock picker. You're not a trader. You're not going to buy this so your job is to maintain the pension system for hawaii for generations right how do you view the world the economy the markets right, right now I, I would have to say i'm probably super bearish I, i'm always kind super of bearish i am bearish i'm always kind of a, a perma bear uh by nature but i two years ago we had a conversation a year ago about how i thought inflation was going to be high and persistent and i would say well I, you nailed it <laughs> my one good call um, but, but I still think it's going to be high. I'm not in the camp that it's going to decrease towards the end of next year. I think we're going to see higher prints. Um, and so I've been protecting my portfolio for the last uh, couple of years with that in mind, trying to make sure that we have you know real money to pay out to our beneficiaries. And how much are you managing now? $22 billion. Okay, so most of our viewers right now, I'm guessing, do not manage <laughs> that much on their own. But I hope you all do someday. Um, so they, they've got a different viewpoint. Yes. But if they feel like you, if they're bearish, they're dealing with inflation, how do you maneuver your portfolio to manage that? Where do you look for in the markets? Well, one thing that's actually slightly a positive is the, the recent sell-off is actually a good thing, right? You don't want to be buying at these at the high levels. You kind of want things to reset and come back yep. down. But if inflation is here and prices are higher, and I think one thing that's been scary recently for even uh, you know retail investors has been even the things that historically are defensive in these scenarios have kind of you know baby out with the bathwater lately. But you've got to look for things that will sustain in that environment. So where can you where where can you push through price increases? What do people need? So um, one thing that we're looking at is home builders, for example. Uh, people are going to need homes. If, if, even if prices increase, people eventually need somewhere to live. And from a historical perspective, think back to the 80s, people still bought houses there when rates you know, were much higher, multiples higher than where they are now. Um, so that's one place we look. And real assets do work better in an inflationary environment. Yeah. Things. It depends. Physical things. It depends on what kind, right? Uh, they're not all created equal. But yes, if you can have something with cash flows that uh, that are you know adjustable and um, and you can get real money out of that, and you can have investments that pay off over the long term, then I don't think you should worry. If, you, if you're investing for 20 years period, 30 year period, it'll all be okay. But if you're a short term trader who's trying to make money in this in this time period, that's more challenging. Uh, but yes, we are overweight to real or trying to go more overweight to real assets. Uh, because we think that's going to be a good store of value. But it's hard for you because you move like a super tanker. I mean, <laughs> you move slowly. You're big, you move slowly, and you leave things in your wake when you make that move. So when you when you change, when you say, you wake up one morning and you say, I'm bearish now. Yes. Because uh, you've been rolling over slowly. How long does it take you to make these moves and how do you come to the conclusion, I, I need to do this. I need to sell this and buy that. So yes, we are large. We're not as large as some of, the, of our peers that suffer more from that problem, right? So I have peers that are $350 billion. I yeah. think it's much harder for them to move. For us, it's been a long-term trajectory. The last two years I was moving in this direction, taking down our equity overweight, right? Um, so it, it's not like this all happened overnight. But one thing that we, we can do as a source of long-term investments is uh, we can be a liquidity provider in these sorts of events. 
events. And that is something that we can capitalize on. So in March of 2020, during COVID, we actually lost about 8% at the maximum downturn in the market. So other funds that were suffering from some liquidity provision, we can actually be a buyer in that sort of scenario. Um, so yeah, we don't we don't try to move things too aggressively in the short term. We try to think more long term, but we are opportunistic when we can be. Is this is this more out of the stock market? When you say bearish, are you moving out of the equity market and into other things? Yeah, so uh, on multiple levels. So one, uh, we took down our rates exposure over the last couple of years because I think we weren't super constructive. What does that mean? Uh, okay, so bond market. Yep. Um, so we, you know, I think most people have suffered in, in bonds over the last couple of years, notwithstanding a 40-year bull market, right? Um, so we took some of our uh, principal protection, rates exposure, uh, rate sensitive assets down. We took our, I would say, on our equity book, what we have been decreasing is our lower beta equities um, in, in favor of uh, getting more. And what does that mean? <laughs> so low volatility. I'm just a simple TV guy. Okay, so uh, low vol, <laughs> low, I don't think that's true. Low vol equities, min vol equities in favor of more beta one type equities. Uh, why would we be doing that? So our portfolio moved more into alternatives and private markets. So we didn't need to get uh, less aggressive on, on both sides of the coin. We were dampening our volatility by going to some of these private market assets. We didn't want to do that for the same reason on the equity side. And, and also, I'm not anti-equities. Over the long term, if you want to make money, I don't know how you do it without being invested in the public equity market. You just have to be more selective with what you're looking for, right? So you're not just going to buy the overall S&P 500 and, and let it ride? So I would... So I would say right now, that's probably not what you want to do, right? So if you're looking at what's happening in the S&P, there are individual stocks that are doing okay. But the S&P 500 is, is kind of taking a bloodbath right now, right? Yeah. Um, but there are still... NASDAQ worse. I mean, it's getting crushed. It's getting crushed, right? But there are still pockets of opportunity in there. So I think, you know, every couple of years people say, now is the time you want to look for alpha. You want to be more selective in like the equities you're buying. And, but it's true, right? There are companies out there with good cash flows, um, with stable earnings. And these are the things you want to go go look for, right? Well, I think it's, listen, a lot of our CNBC and CNBC Pro audience that may be tuning in right now, maybe are newer in the markets. And it's real easy to feel good, am I right, everybody out there, when things are going up. We haven't had this kind of a downturn outside of the pandemic, the March. But that, that was so quick and so shocking, and it just felt different. And yep. then the Fed came to the rescue, Congress threw a bunch of money, and the market's quickly turned around. This feels more like 07. How do you frame it right now? Because it is a nervous time, especially for investors that maybe have not gone through this before. Stocks are down 70% in four months. Peloton, Teladoc, former high Netflix. Okay, but did you want to buy when they were up? I mean, I, so. Well, that's it. You got to buy low, right? <laughs> right? Warren Buffett, I think, said buy low, sell high, <laughs> no, buy high, sell low. I don't know which one. Wait, but you want to look for those opportunities. It's actually a. It, from my perspective, the shoe was going to drop. It has now happened. Now is the time you want to be looking for these pockets of opportunity. Um, there was research that came out a couple of weeks ago that um, in the in the last 13 years, every time sentiment gets this low, it's actually 100% positive return in the equity markets over the next six months. I don't know how much I believe data that goes back 13 years, um, but there are opportunities for buying. And I think we needed this reset, right? I actually feel less scared than I did two months ago because to me, everything was overvalued and overpriced at that point. Now things are starting to make a little bit more sense. Back to the home buyer example. Some are you of ready to get a little more heavily into back into equities? I think eventually we'll get back into bonds and and, and start going back into equities, right? I, I don't think over the long term I'm necessarily uh, bearish on equities. I do think inflation is going to be persistently higher. I think growth out, growth prospects are going to be challenged. We still have more to see with global supply chains coming out of China and the impact there from their shutdowns. Uh, I was really You live in Hawaii. <laughs> I'm told that's an island chain. You're very reliant on shipping. So you probably, a Matson, right? Yes. You probably have not only a professional worldview on inflation, but you live it every yes. day. Your family relies on things brought in by ship yes. or plane. You don't think inflation is getting, is it going to get worse or is it just not going to get a lot better? 
I think it's getting worse. I, I, first of all, the, the home price appreciation and owner's equivalent rent really hasn't fully priced into the inflation data that we're seeing yet. It, it, it reminds me of about two, two decades ago when uh, economists were saying, everything's fine, you're fine, but the average consumer doesn't feel it's fine. Your everyday goods and services are more expensive. That is literally the definition of inflation. You're paying more and getting less, right? That's happening everywhere, and it hasn't gotten fully priced in. Yes, I think it's going to get, I think it's going to get worse. And I could be wrong, but that's not a risk I don't want to try to account for. So what does the Fed do on Wednesday? And do you, do you care? Do you care? <laughs> I do care. I always feel like you guys are trying to get me in trouble with the Fed every time I'm on here. Um, I'll I, say it if you want. <laughs> don't worry. I, I do care. I think they're late to the party. I think everybody is probably kind yeah. of saying that now too, right? And I think the chance... Or they're of, trying to put... And I'll say it so you don't have to. They're, they're trying to put out the fire they help create. Right. And I think that they've proven they don't really care what happens in equity markets now to try to right this wrong. That's that's why I care. I think that there's going to be something that breaks. I'm not sure what it is. No one's ever sure until they write the book six months later. Uh, but something's going to break, and we want to be prepared for whatever that might be. But uh, yeah, I, I think trust them. <sighs> well, look. They, Scott Minard of Guggenheim told us uh, <laughs> when we taped it yesterday, this morning on Worldwide Exchange. 5 a.m. Eastern, tune in every day. Uh, your evening, by the way, 11 p.m. or whatever in Hawaii. Uh, he didn't trust them. He said it. I don't trust the Fed. Basically, he's like, they, they, they caused this mess, and now they're trying to get us out of the mess they caused. Yeah. Well, I was on a panel with Scott last year at this very conference, and we were both on the same side of the inflation debate back then. And I think we were both saying, what is happening now? Like, why are, why are we moving like this? Why is this happening? I think... Uh, yes, the narrative has switched. They can switch again. It's not that I don't trust them. I think they have a lot of tools um, in, in their box. I don't know if anyone truly understands how to fix inflation. I don't know if anyone truly understands the drivers of inflation, myself included. So how do you solve for something that no one can really explain? Well, the way you solve inflation is by inducing a recession. Yes. I mean, I mean, I hate it's It's historically. Right. And we all hope that's not what happens. Right. It seems hard. So if you believe you've got that worldview, Elizabeth, yeah. obviously, um, decreased public equity exposure. You like home builders. Any parts of bond market look good to you? Are you buying government bonds it's or high yield bonds, corporate credit? Uh, I don't personally for me. I don't think it's time to go back into the bond market just yet. Um, I Which part? Uh, well, so like tenure, I don't think is attractive right now at this level. I know there's a lot of money managers out there, much smarter than me. They're saying buy at 280. I'm not there. Um, in terms of credit, I'm actually more interested in uh, what distress is going to do over the next couple of years. We've been seeing uh, some changes in lending standards, some changes in covenants, some changes uh, in what the definition of delinquency means. That is terrifying when you start changing the definition of what it's delinquency 2007 is. 2007 type stuff. It is. And I was a, I have traded passers in 2007. And so this is near and dear to my heart. That's scary. At the same time, that's an opportunity. And that should be something we should be looking for uh, and to pivot in maybe, maybe in 2023. Are you investing as if we're going into recession? I am investing as if that is a very high probability and we want to be able to put capital into it uh, as soon as we see some triggers in the market and as soon as we see uh, those opportunities coming. So if you're looking for it, you know, or our viewers right now are looking for an historical model, right? You go back in time and you say, if it's like this and this is what happened to stocks, what happened to bonds. Is there a mo is this 1981? Is it 2000? Is it 1999? Is it 2007? Is it its own thing? It's a great question. Because the pandemic is obviously something that we haven't seen to this magnitude since 1990. It's probably closer, I would say, to the early 1980s than any of the other examples that you just gave, but it's, for so many reasons that you know, very different, right? Like, rates are in a very different place. Monetary policy is in a very different place. The world geopolitical stage is in a very different place. But if I had to point to one, it's probably most similar to that. But yeah. no two instances in history were the same, and people have these behavioral, bi I think uh, Warren Buffett said it this weekend, the reason, like, no, no two scenarios are the same is people get these biases in their mind and they trade very differently after that, right? Are you putting all 100% of your assets into Bitcoin? 100%. It's a joke. I'm joking. Leveraging. But you mentioned 200 Buffett. 200% of my I'll assets. Let you, well, yeah, all of it. Leverage <laughs> it up. I mean, Buffett and Munger, I mean, they didn't, well, especially Munger didn't mince words about crypto. I mean, basically called it a fraud. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's going to zero. I mean, he's 98 years old, so he's, he's entitled to his opinion. Do you have a viewpoint? Do you guys invest the public money into crypto? 
around the margin maybe? I would be hard pressed to find institu institutional investor that doesn't have exposure to that market, whether or not they know it. Everyone yeah. has exposure there, right? You gotta be there. What is it? I don't know, but you have to invest in it. Uh, I, I, I think, Look, personally versus professionally are two different stories on how I feel about that market. Yeah. I would say in general. You can give us either one. Right? <laughs> I'm not a big fan of investing things without some intrinsic store of value in them, right? And so I feel very similar about certain parts of the commodity market for that reason. I don't like investing in things that are purely determined by supply and demand dynamics. Uh, that's probably because the University of Chicago beat that into my head for years, right? <laughs> but I feel very similar about that. I think it's fine if you want uh, some speculative type of investment. I don't know that I'm speculating with $22 billion worth of pension assets in it, though. Yeah, the uh, Hawaii Employment or Employees Retirement System, HERS. <laughs> yes. The CIO, Elizabeth Burton. <laughs> Real pleasure to have you on the CBC Pro live stream talk. Uh, was it painless? Always painless. See, Thank it wasn't you, so bad. <laughs> We were great. talking, folks, before this. This is all live and unscripted. It's just like, what are you going to ask me? I'm like, I don't know. Let's just have a conversation. <laughs> and it kind of works out, doesn't it? It does. Real work pleasure. Out. Elizabeth, Thanks, thank Brian. you. Kicked it off. I don't know how we're going to do The other three guests have a long way to go to follow up on that. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Brian. All right, so, folks, here's what we're going to do now because this is live. We're going to mute. You're not going to hear anything. Don't worry. But you're going to see the crowd behind us here at the Beverly Hilton in, in Los Angeles. We're going to bring in our next guest, Jason Brady of Thornbury. He's got some individual stock picks for you. So just sit tight. It's going to go mute. We'll be back up in about, I don't know, 90 seconds or two minutes. Elizabeth, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Stay in touch. <laughs>Sound is up. Welcome back to the CNBC Pro live stream event, folks. Brian Sullivan here for the Milk and Global Conference. Joined by Jason Brady, CEO of Thornburg Investment Management. Jason, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a huge pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, no. Uh, listen, we have, we, have, we have the rarest commodity. We talk about commodities on CNBC. Right now, we have the rarest commodity of all, and that is time. We've got 15 minutes together to go through this market. Where are it's Thornburg? You guys do a fantastic job. Tucked away there in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which literally you think differently. Probably because you're not in the group think. It's true. It's true. How do you see the markets and the economy right now? Well, being in Santa Fe, it's an opportunity for perspective. Um, clear air. Clear air for sure. You can see miles and miles. And uh, it's... It is a time and a place where I think we all need some perspective. You have a lot going on in the marketplace. You have a lot going on macro. I mean, just today, obviously, you have the Fed on Wednesday. You have jobs on Friday. So it's very easy to get caught up in moment to moment to moment. Um, I'm, I'm doing a panel uh, at the conference on Wednesday and talking to some large institutional investors. Their time horizon is 10, 15, yes. 20 years. And so it's an opportunity here and in Santa Fe to really get that long-term perspective while understanding that in a day-to-day, -day, if you don't get to keep playing the game, if you don't do it right day-to-day, -day, yeah. you can lose it all. So it's, it's a balance here, uh, both at A lot of our viewers right now, a lot of our subscribers, a lot of your clients, mm -hmm. and, and there's probably, by the way, a lot of people that are the same. Mm -hmm. They're clients of you, they watch us. They're scared right now. Yeah. I would imagine, they're, what are they asking you? I think they're trying to figure out what just happened. Yeah. Uh, we had we had a couple of December, years. December, roaring 20s, everything's, oh, everything's rocking. everything's magical, don't worry about it. Four months later, we're like, what? I just got run over by a car, what happened? That's right, that's right. And that whipsaw is, look, it's part of markets, but it, 
it, in 2020, it happened and we sort of saw why. We sort of said, okay, well, geez, I'm trying to survive both financially and physically. Yeah. So that was a, a different feel. This is a little bit more like, hey, the markets are doing this. Why are they doing this? And I think having that understanding and and really digging into that is what we're doing for clients and, and how we're chatting with them about how do we execute going forward. And, and part of what you guys do so well is you find opportunity. And the one thing about down markets mm -hmm. is that it's hard, I mean, you, you gotta hold your nose and buy, right? Because it is scary. Yes. But you want to buy lower, valuations have come down. Yes. In some cases, many people think valuations have gotten stupid, for lack of a better term. It's cheap for many, like an SAP, for example. But literally everything gets sold, and then it's your job and your team's job, right, Jason, to go through and say, that shouldn't have been sold that much. That And SAP is one of those. SAP is certainly one, and the broader dynamic is not only just that equities have gone down, but fixed income has gone down at the same time, and that's been worrisome. So what do you do, what do you look at in the equity market in particular for those survivors, for the ones with good revenue streams, actually as the market shifts from revenue to income, to the balance sheet, and that's what happens in a bear market, you need to make sure you have one of those survivors. So SAP is a great example. It's like a caught up in the European sell-off. Um, it's trading cheap to itself, cheap to its sector, recurring revenues. It is, it is survivor tech, as opposed to, oh my gosh, if I stop looking at revenue, I start looking at income, this doesn't look so great, which is the dynamic we've got. Yeah, and, and SAP is an odd company in the sense mm -hmm. that it's it's German, mm -hmm. uh, but it really is a U.S. tech company. They got a huge presence, obviously, in the United States, but yet they kind of get swept up with the European markets, which have gotten hammered as well because they're dealing with their obviously the, the fallout of Ukraine and their sure. own energy and electricity crisis, probably going sure. into a deep recession, if not worse. Uh, so you think SAP maybe is a value opportunity because it gets caught up in that kind of stuff. But it's really a U.S. tech software company. It's kind That's of a right. Salesforce-ish. That's exactly right. And, and you know, again, trading in a very different multiple. So what part of the perspective of being in Santa Fe, right? You say, look, I don't really care where we are, that the world exists as it is today, and it's great to be at a conference here, but the reality is SAP's headquarters do not determine its business. We all are global investors now. We're all being affected by the Ukraine conflict. We're all being affected by economic slowdown. So SAP is that global company, again, with terrific, terrific subscription revenue, a really robust business model, and again, not very expensive. It's got a, it's got a dividend yield. I mean, goodness gracious, how many tech companies are actually paying out cash? Well, that's a fair point. Uh, let's switch gears and talk about Samuel L. Jackson. Okay. What's in your wallet? Cap because, One, yeah. because Here's the thing, okay? I can't tell you what Capital One does. I mean, I know they've got a credit card business. Okay, they do a lot. That's a big, their that's commercials a big are it. ubiquitous. Yes. You watch basketball or any sporting sure. event, football, it's every commercial break sure. is Jennifer Garner or Samuel L. Jackson. But everybody I talk to is like, they've got this underappreciated sort of capital markets business I know nothing about. Tell us about what Capital One actually is. So they're an excellent operator. They're an excellent operator. Operator of what? Uh, well, the, the biggest piece of their business is the credit card business. And that is, that's a lot to manage. So if you think about a couple of different types of banking businesses, corporate banking, you know, big clients, keep track of those. If you're being super reductive, then you have consumer business, lots of small balances. So to be an excellent operator in a consumer business, in this case, for the credit card, is, is really a competitive advantage. Again, not expensive, great balance sheet. We're talking five times earnings, not that you should really look at financial five so much. Time. Five times uh, this year's. So great, great balance sheet. Again, returning capital shareholders in the form of dividend yield. So this is the center of what we view at Thornburg as one of the brightest spots in the economy, which is the consumer. Um, balance sheets, or excuse me, the balance sheet of the consumer at the end of this past year was eight times better than before the pandemic in the context of what Repeat cash that, they- eight, in cash, eight times better. Cash they had in the bank. You go talk to uh, Bank of America, you talk to JP Morgan, cash in the bank eight times more on average than it was before the pandemic. Now look, that's only one measure, but the consumer is much, much healthier than for example, some of corporate America. So what I would tell you is the consumer balance sheet is one you want to be more exposed to. And again, an excellent operator. Delinquency rates are low. Very low. Default rates are low. I mean, they, could, they obviously probably will and can go up, but you're not concerned right now, it sounds like. I think that they will go up. Uh, so the question is- But up from is, a, a tiny base. From a very low level. So. 
everybody looks for an analog, right? I think the best analog for what we're experiencing now is, is not the 80s or the 70s. It's actually the 2000s, right? The, the beginning of the 2000s. So strong consumer, relatively over levered um, c corporate balance sheet, some, some real changes in the sort of broader macro dynamic, yeah. the geopolitical and uh, becoming to the fore. But ultimately, that was a terrible market dynamic, especially for tech names, yep. but actually a fairly shallow recession. And some of the best uh, exposure that you could have there was, again, to the consumer. Another name in that space that you guys like at Thornburg is, is Visa. Yeah. I mean, is that a very kind of make the same arguments you just made, insert V for COF? It's more expensive. Um, it's got a more entrenched market position. Uh, it is. It is my considered opinion that the end game for a lot of fintech, which would be a lot of what is what is threatening in theory Visa's business, meaning they buy them. Uh, that is my belief. That's the end game, right? Yeah. The, the the business Every model for fintech, fintech founders is to hope right. right away is to be bought. Exactly, exactly. By Visa, because, right. because there's real there's real value in that network. Uh, and and look, sadly, what you're seeing is when you cut folks off from that network, which is happening in Russia, it's it's very very disruptive. So that is a that is a real value value proposition, again, very good business model, recurring revenue, a survivor, a tech survivor as well, actually. JP Morgan, obviously, we love Jamie Dimon at CNBC. I mean, you know, he, he speaks and we run red headlines and, you know, his shareholder letter, 44 pages, I think, this year. Sure. Different business. They're not Capital One. I mean, they're right. capital no. markets. They're cap right. But they're different, yes. right? They're, yes. they're a bank, Chase, but they're also a big trading firm. So they rely on Wall Street's fortunes. They do. Doesn't sound like you're afraid of what's happening on Wall Street affecting JPM. Maybe they make money from it. Look, I, I, I think that the cult of personality that, that investors sometimes follow is, is probably destructive. I, I would imagine Jamie Dimon would agree, actually. Um, this is a, a franchise that, for sure, Jamie Dimon heads, but is strong across all of their verticals. Um, again, a real balance sheet success story. Uh, if, if you want to worry about financials, and you can, worry about balance sheets. Again, as we shift from the income statement to the balance sheet, that, that strength is critical. It's not expensive again. So I, I think that investors don't want to just look for value and cheap stocks. That's a way to get massively cyclical, massively problematic. And in fact, I am sure a lot of people have been talking to you since the beginning of the year, hey, financials are the place to be, go buy financials. Yeah. And it hasn't worked out so hot, right? So we're, we, let's take stock now. What, again, is the valuation? What does that look like? Is it a survivor? 2001, the banks went down, but they came back again. It was a source of strength, and they have the same strong balance sheet that they had then, as opposed to uh, the, the intervening recession. New Mexico. <laughs> is, and many people may not realize this, and uh, I did not until a couple years ago, is kind of the new frontier for oil and gas. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the new Permian. I mean, it's a part of the it's Permian. It's part of the Permian, yeah. Um, but it's, it's a boom town, you know, in the southeastern part of the state. It is. Some of that's on federal land, so there's concern about drilling Chesapeake Energy. Mm -hmm. Been up, been down, been bankrupt, come right. back. Why is that a name you'd like? So CHK. I, talk, I talk about balance Doug sheets, Lawler. right? And I'm talking about a company that went bankrupt. So what's, yeah. what's well, up? Well, the chapter 11 they process- They cleaned up the books. I exactly, mean, exactly. The chapter 11 process works in that way. Yeah, I, I grew up as a debt investor, so it maybe sometimes pains me to so say this. They secretly like that. Right, mm. well, it's, it's a challenge. But if you look at energy demand, Globally, of course. Yeah. If you look at an it's energy, nowhere but up. an energy transition. Yep. Right. So natural gas is a transitional fuel, right? You want to get New Mexico. We think that's the point. We think you're betting on. We that. think. Well, I'm betting that traditional fuel. Yes. It wasn't, and now suddenly it's it's oh well natural. We need it you know, because we, we realize can't move fast enough. We can't move yeah. fast enough. So New Mexico actually, as a state, as a utility, PNM has a huge portion of coal generation. And I can assure you, nobody wants to have coal generation. That's, that's right going now. away. That's yeah. got to go. So, what, where are you going to bring it? As you say, source of fuel for New Mexico is good, but actually, New Mexico with its beautiful sunshine has got coal. It does. Yes. Yeah, yes. that'll coal go. Generation. And guess what else is going to? Where, where else the demand is? Obviously, you're going to liquefy natural gas that we've got to supply to Europe. So, the demand for natural gas increases. 
for sure it is that that moves around with the Chesapeake can move around as we saw with chapter 11 yeah. with that demand but in a balanced portfolio it's not the only position you have the balanced portfolio you're talking about something with an upwards of 8% dividend yield again yeah, 8% expensive. I mean that's pretty good I mean, I mean it's almost like two, a high yield bond right 2x <laughs> times a 10 year treasury even at these rates correct well exactly I mean, yep 8x from 2 years ago yeah right well there. it was exactly zero yeah. <laughs> It's a thousand percent from nothing. <laughs> Divide by zero, yeah. Correct. Yeah, we'll go infinity. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they're paying you. They're paying you to wait. They're paying you to. And you're not even waiting. Look, the, the stock has performed fairly well. Just recently, not so much. Again, a slowdown, which again, I believe we will get. I will believe we will get a slowdown. Probably a shallow recession a year, year and a half yeah. from now. Well, everything's been sold lately. Everything's I mean, been it, sold. Even energy stocks are well outperforming, but even some of them are down. 10-15% in a matter of a month. Everything exactly. just got dumped. Exactly. So what, picking through that, being opportunistic, which again is a Thornburg calling card, what are you being opportunistic with? What are you buying into? Yeah. And if I have a relatively dim view of what's going to happen in the next year and a half, two years, again, what is the survivor there? Yeah. And you know, somebody that cleared off their entire balance sheet in Chapter 11, not entire, cleared off in Chapter 11 is a better a better. And let's, let's wrap it up and stay on energy because uh, Total, sure. not Total, Total Energies, they changed their name, uh, <laughs> TTE, the US, French. Yep. This is one of the world's biggest renewable companies. And yes. People, they're big in oil and gas. You go to France and you can fill up with a Total gas a petrol station for 10 bucks a gallon. <laughs> but they're a huge renewable play and, and only getting bigger. Mm -hmm. But they don't get a lot of attention or love. That's right. What That's do you right. like about them? It goes back to the same thing. So it was 665 uh, filling up here. So not too different, maybe. There, there's a CEO of GM walking by us right there, by the way, Mary Barr. We can ask how she's going to meet yeah, the I'm going to uh, do a panel with Mary later. We should ask her about right. the energy transition. Right. What, you got a point uh, of view on electric cars. What's the gas mileage of the fleet going to be in 20? Well, right? unlimited, because there is no gas, right. right? I mean, what is the, the equivalent range? <laughs> Hello, General Motors CEO. That's the beauty of the milk and conference. All right, so Total Energy. It's, it is exactly what you described. Um, it's a, 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 a great ESG transition story, underappreciated in that regard. It is caught up in a European sell-off. It is cash flow generative. So one of the things that has caused energy to be one of the leaders in this, in this last four months, albeit more recently a relative leader, not an absolute, st still down, but holding yeah. up very well, yep. is that many of those companies, to include the two that we've talked about, have shifted from drill, drill, drill to let's, let's, let's be cash flow generative. And take that cash flow generation and reinvest in a, a renewables business. And, and, total total is, they're, and they're huge in emerging markets. You know, that's why we don't talk about them a lot, but what they're doing in, in Africa mm -hmm. and other emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And as a huge renewables player, so TTE, right. I love it. We got SAP, Capital One, <laughs> Visa, Chesapeake, Total, JPM. It, and JP, thank you. It's a balanced, a balanced portfolio in the context of a very rocky market. And a comforting portfolio in a very rocky market. It generates Jason. cash, generates I cash. Feel better. I don't know how you feel, I feel better. I was nervous, now I feel okay. <laughs> Jason Brady, CEO of Thornburg Investment Management. Uh, have a great conference. Thank you. Safe trip back home to Santa Fe. It'll Send be us some one. pottery right. next time we, <laughs> right. we sit down together. All right, folks, we're going to take a short break on the CNBC Pro live stream and back up with another great guest. We'll see you in about 90 seconds. We're going to go mute, and then we'll be back on. Jason, thank you very much. Cheers. Appreciate it, man. That was fantastic. That was no, real, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And welcome back to the CNBC Pro live stream event for the Milken Global Conference. We are pleased to be joined by Todd Jablonski, he's the CIO of Global Asset Allocation. Todd, a pleasure. Principal, I mean, you guys, you're big. We how, are. how big are you guys? 
Well, in asset allocation, we're currently managing around 156 billion in multi-asset strategies. Just pocket change. Ah, that's a lot of other people's money, but we spend a great deal of time and care making sure we look after it and invest it in accordance with the investment guidelines to help them meet their investment goals. Yeah, and well, and more importantly, your job at principal is, I would, and correct me if this is, I mean, you want to make sure the money is there. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's it, right? I mean, they're, you're stewards of the capital, so you're not placing big, risky bets. You are a safety first, I would imagine, ship. Uh, this is a turbulent sea. I'm, I'm going to run out of maritime analogies, Todd, you forgive me. Because uh, you probably live in, what, Iowa or something? Seattle. So oh, maritime Seattle. works. Okay, so maritime does work. How are you navigating today's market? Well, Captain. indeed. We <laughs> We do have a great deal of retirement clients and retirement assets in there. I do think you have to think long term around where is the safety, what is the projected return, and what are the appropriate risks involved. But there's also risk seeking, right? There's also risk taking in every investment strategy to really maximize the potential of risk adjusted returns. Now across principle today, in multi-asset, I'm going to point to a few spots where I think where we see some tactical asset allocation okay. opportunities. Please. In particular, we still like U.S. equities, Brian. I'd lead there. You see equities, I think, in the U.S., despite the pullback in big cap tech, I think can be industry, excuse me, global leading ahead of EM, ahead of DM. And at the same time, there are pockets in the bond market like high yield that we like. But bring it all home, I'd say tactically you can like U.S. equities, you can like U.S. dollar high yield, but look to alternatives, specialty, commodities, real assets, natural resources. Those inflation sensitive groups, I think, are have a lot of tailwind behind them. Okay, so you just kind of, you gave us the menu for the next 14 minutes, Todd. So let's dive a little <laughs> more into that, uh, into that menu. Uh, U.S. equities, obviously we're supposed to, here's the weird thing about financial markets. Everybody wants something cheap, but when prices go down, people get scared. It's normal human reaction. It's psychology. It hurts. Watch your balances go down every day. How do you stay resolute and find where in the equity markets that, that things are going to keep going down versus that's on sale, I want that? Well, I think the key thing to remember on valuation is that it's extremely informative over the next 20 years, but not particularly informative at all over the next year or maybe even the next two. If you recall, over the previous decade, we carried high equity valuations year after year after year. Yeah. So when you see this kind of pullback, yes, emotions bubble up. You start to circulate and percolate a lot of response to the negative direction. In particular, fixed income investors. Think about core bond investors. They bought those bonds for stability. They just had the worst quarter in 40 years in the bond market. First time, I think, since 1994 that the equity markets and the government bond market fell at the same time. I mean, that's pretty unbelievable. And that was also, by the way, the last super aggressive Fed rate hike tightening cycle. Well, think about the first quarter. You had the S&P decline 4.6%, and it did better than the Barclays Ag. I mean, how that is a very rare occurrence. And I think it speaks to the kind of discipline investors need to have in terms of finding that value. What we do see is there are pockets of cheapness now outside the U.S. In Europe, in Asia, you can find reasonable valuations. And while we're a little encouraged by some of the sentiment in Europe that may have bottomed out, U.S. still looks to us like a more attractive tactical opportunity. So... I'm old. This is my 21st Milk and Global Conference. I'm dating myself. I've lived through now two major down, three with the pandemic, but that was short-lived from an equity perspective. 99 to 2001, took about two years. 07 to 09, took about two years. I'm talking about for the equity market to bottom. We're four months in. Is this it, or do you think we can go another year and a half? Where, or, or does the market move faster now, market structure? It feels like things have changed where we live a year and a month, if that makes sense. And we are seeing investors essentially shorten up their horizons, but I still think having a couple key elements can give investors success in this kind of environment. First, have a strategic asset allocation. Know what you're going to retreat to when risk on no longer feels quite as appropriate. So I think having that predefined so that you can essentially move back to that true north of diversification yeah. is step so one. So where is that point for you right now? You said U.S. equities look attractive. 
You, it said, sounds like you're upping your allocation to the Amer American stock market. Oh, uh, I think that's a decline. We've actually trimmed our exposure to U.S. equities, pulled back a bit, but we do remain overweight. From okay. an actionable perspective, again, beyond just the equity side, I think I'd point investors really to the commodities, natural resources, infrastructure, and other diversified real assets that are getting a great bit of tailwind yeah. behind them with the inflation. Are you buying rate. the physical asset, or do you buy the futures, or do you buy equities and debt? Or D, all the above, Todd? I think it's D, all the above. I'd actually encourage clients to take a look at diversified strategies in that vein, because when you look at equities alone, you look at structured notes alone, you look at direct ownership alone, each one of those carries some unique risks. I think a basket of diversified real assets is really the best implementation for Any most real assets that you like more than others? I think I'd point to commodities right now as sort of as okay. a group. Oil, corn. I think you can look at wine, whatever you guys have over there in Seattle, fish. <laughs> How are salmon futures doing? <laughs> salmon, I'll check in on the salmon <laughs> futures. But it's, a, it's an interesting area. Mostly agricultural metals, and I would point to food. In yeah. particular, where you yeah. see backwardation in the commodity markets that's historically been associated in periods where you've had a supply undersupply. Yeah. So that feels a lot like today, right? We've had the undersupply, we've had the backwardation. I think that does portend good things for commodity markets. I also note that the food expenditure as a percentage of DM consumers is pretty low. And developed pretty, markets. Yeah, developed markets. Yeah, wealthier nations. Correct. And in emerging markets, I think you find that that food cost is a substantially higher portion. It is. It's a real concern about food shortages. I, I, it's unbelievable what's happened. I think corn is up 40% this year or any year. Highest in 10 years. I mean, sounds like you're not, that's, in your mind, that's not going away anytime soon, Tom. I think you could see a bit of a sustained super commodity cycle. Wow. And essentially, you do see commodity producers. Sounds like Jeff Curry at Goldman Sachs. He believes the same thing. Well, I mean, he and I may align for the right reasons. Yeah. I mean, you can look at Brazil, you can look at other commodity exporting countries. And a lot of those, I think, have favorable conditions because we expect a persistence of the supply chain issues, the undersupply, and demand, of course, remains strong. That's an environment that speaks to inflation and commodities. In, in inflationary environments, you, you generally, historically anyway, and who knows if history is going to repeat itself, you want to own hard assets, to your point. I mean, literally, I know hedge fund managers that are buying farms, and you wonder why they're buying art, because hard cars, hard assets. I mean, would you literally, maybe Todd Jabonski, the person, not the CIO, buy farmland, buy crops? I mean, In fact, I've met many investors, especially around Iowa, who do, in fact, invest pretty actively in farmland, yeah. timberland, a lot of structures. What I think you're speaking to is a lot of the appeal of private assets today, right? Sure. In many ways, getting those direct exposures to real estate, getting those direct exposures to PE or private debt, those give you the right kind of hard assets, if you structure them the right way, yeah. that I think gives you the inflation protection and some interesting divergence. I wonder if they're like Reddit subboards, like Wall Street corn bets. You know what I mean? Like because we were talking about, when we still are NFTs and crypto and and you know growth stocks, and now we're talking about farms. And I mean, we're ch not you. You probably were early to the game, but the switch in just a matter of months, Todd. I don't know how long you've been doing this. I have. I've been doing this 25 years. I've never seen a market flip this quickly. Oh yeah, I think I might agree with that. Say, so I've been doing this 20 years, and I tell you, I haven't seen such a V-shaped turn in sentiment. Yeah. I think it pre. I mean, March of 2020, but that was the pandemic. We're all just like trying not, you know, it was like different world, and the markets came back so rapidly. But think about the trifecta of new challenges that just hit in this quarter. Right in the first quarter, you had boom. All of a sudden, the Fed is trying to achieve a splashless entry into a pool Good luck. from a higher platform. At yeah. the same time, you've got the com Ukraine crisis driving commodity markets in yeah. new directions, and finally, brand new, stagflation. So you put those three things together, yeah. that's enough to turn around global and equity. I, I like your time. diving analogy because you made me think about the Rodney Dangerfield movie, Back to School. I don't know if you ever saw it. He was an old diver. At the end, he does this thing called the Triple Lindy. It's a, it's a fake dive. I feel like the Fed is trying to do the triple Lindy. Yeah, it's effectively a, impossible, but you never know. What, what's your view on the Fed? We got a meeting on Wednesday. It's got a lot of expectation. I'm sure you're watching it keenly. Oh, yeah. What I, do you need to hear? What do you want to hear? 
What I expect to hear, I think, is that we're going to get 50 bips of tightening and that we're going to get an aggressive move up in the case of quantitative tightening. And those are both things. The balance sheet. Yeah, on the balance sheet. I expect both of those things to come through and they're definitely warranted. I think it's pretty clear we're behind the curve on inflation. That first 25 basis point move wasn't nearly enough to begin arresting some of the forces driving the inflation. I expect the Fed to be far more well, they, aggressive. Well, you, <laughs> I've talked to people here that think they're going to raise rates every meeting, and I've got a lot of people here that are starting to whisper, I think they're going to have to back off because they don't want to overshoot. What's your view? I think the Fed has to arrest inflation. We've learned this, I think, through so many historical examples, but I do expect Chairman Powell and the rest of the Fed to move aggressively, get that contain, get inflation contained, get to that neutral rate. Is it two, two and a half? You know, I've heard a range of hosts, but they have, they have to stick with that program of arresting yeah. inflation, even if it means dampening economic activity. Todd Jablonski, Principal Global Investors, I love it. Hard assets, farmland, salmon futures. Let us know how they're doing up there in Seattle. But an interesting worldview. Really appreciate your time your insight and your knowledge. Todd, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, folks. Again, our last short break here on CNBC Pro, and then we're up with Jace Albee of the Teachers Texas Retirement System. More big money inside in the CNBC Pro event right after this short break. Todd, thank you very much. to this special CNBC Pro live stream for the Milken Global Conference. Three down, one victim to go. Jay Hobby <laughs> of the Texas Teachers Retirement System. $204 billion under management. And by the way, outperformed last year, last 18.5% versus 16.5% benchmark. Yeah, exactly. 2% Two, alpha. It's tremendous. How'd I mean, you do it? Um, and how are you doing it now? Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, What have you done for us lately, Jay? Yeah, exactly. Well, one thing that really happened to us last year is we've been big believers in fundamental factors in the uh, stock market. And so things just hit. Um, you know, value kind of came back around. Uh, growth had been outperformed for a very long time. And that had kind of weighed on the portfolio, but that has really hit yeah. and come back through. Uh, and that really just generated a lot of alpha in our public equity portfolio. I'm going to quote that great philosopher, Mike Tyson. Yeah. Everybody has a plan. Until, until they, they get, get punched in the, in the face. face. Absolutely. And last December, like five months ago, everybody was feeling pretty smart, pretty good. Yeah, right? for sure. The calendar changed. Seems like everything changed. It's a lot different. How have you changed your plan? Or have we, you? Yeah, we, we absolutely have. Um, you know, we obviously noticed the uptick in volatility around the geopolitical events in, in Ukraine. And so uh, we did lighten up on risk uh, a little bit in the portfolio, which has really paid dividends. I mean, the idea there was, hey, things are still fundamentally strong in the U.S. economy. Risks are ticking up, though. Probably would make sense to put a little on the, on the, on the side. And so we've done a, a bit of that in the portfolio. Okay. Uh, are, you, are you trimming U.S. equities or are you buying more in the weakness here? Because um, you're a giant super tanker, 204 billion. Yeah, absolutely. You um, move slowly, but when you move, you move markets. For sure, and, and what we do, and that's something we're actually very mindful of. In fact, when we rebalance, uh, we were very mindful of how those flows might uh, might affect the market. But yeah, we are underweight uh, U.S. equity at this point in time, marginally so. You know, we're never going to take very large no. bets, but um, we are we are definitely uh, underweight. This but time. for you to say even on the margin, you're underweight equities. Jace, and you're being modest, but that's a powerful statement. I mean, yeah, exactly. One percent would be a two billion dollar. Would be yeah. well. It would. Uh, yeah, it yeah, would. It would be a million bucks. I mean, yeah. that's a big change. Yes, absolutely, for sure. 
What is it that you saw that made you nervous or less confident or whatever term you want to use? Yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, 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 a what, we, what we really saw make us nervous is capped upside. So we've been talking about the Fed put for a very long time. We're thinking now there's actually a Fed call on equity markets because the Fed needs to move, they need to move rates up. Yep. And so um, as long as the equity markets uh, aren't falling, it's easier for them to do that. And if they're going up and up and up, they can continue to raise and eff effectively put a cap on the uh, on the equity market. So you think, we saw you a think the U.S. Upside. equity market will end the year down this year? Um, uh, I mean, it's going to be pretty hard to, yeah, to, to not write. Where we are <laughs> you got to right? Because, yeah, the S&P 500 down yeah. 11 or so, uh, NASDAQ down 20 or so. Which means you got to gain back, what, 25, 28% to get back to zero. That, correct. Um, we don't think there'll be a recession this year. That would be the, the largest impact that would, would, that would cause that to occur. I mean, the one thing that you would ever want to know as an investor is when is the recession going to happen. If you knew that, you would, knew the, you would know the answer to that and question. Who's going to win this year's Kentucky questions. Derby? I'd like to know right, that ahead exactly. of time. Exactly, too, exactly, right? For sure. What's the winning Powerball number? Yeah. If you trim by a percent in U.S. equities, what are you doing with that money? Um, we can we hold in cash uh, for sure. Cash. Um, yeah. But inflation eats cash. Uh, it does, but you know that opportunity cost uh, is 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 still better than if you're holding it in something that goes down. And so we just prefer not to not not to do that. This is really important. What you're saying. Negative, let's call it negative 3% return on cash. Okay, assuming the 10 years of three real inflation, negative six, whatever yeah. you want to call it. It's, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody in your position in a long time say, I'll take negative five or 6%. Mm -hmm. Because that may be all I'm going to get. And that's the best worst case scenario. Yeah, I mean... You, know, you sound nominal. really bearish. Yeah, I don't mean to sound to, to bear, so bearish. It is at the margins. Um, you know, the, the underlying consumer is still very strong. The U.S. economy is strong. Uh, but then, but the, the market is there. doing it's, something different. It's, it's really kind of it's facing It's telling a those, different story. Exactly. We're, we're facing the headwinds uh, of, of the Fed. Um, every, everything fundamentally says that we're still mid-cycle. Mid-cycle is a very good place to be for risk assets, yep. such as equities, those sorts of things. But the Fed's two mandates, uh, inflation and unemployment, are both just flashing late cycle. Yeah. So you have just a very strange dynamic where the underlying economy is doing well, the consumer is doing well, consumer confidence is there, uh, and yet obviously the Fed is going to move and everyone's anticipating. Are you those, a buyer of hard assets? Numbers. We've been hearing that a lot on this panel, at other panels, people I talked to last night. I mean, people are buying stuff. Yeah, we well, are commodities. Yes, I mean we have a uh, a uh, six percent of our portfolio, or twelve billion dollars, is in energy, natural resources, and infrastructure portfolio. Okay. So private markets, think pipelines, um, think utilities, all of those sorts. Well, of things. Well, you're in Texas. So, you probably have to. It's probably like written into absolutely. your charter. You know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, being in Texas, uh, we're big investors in fossil fuels. Strong believers in that. Um, but I think renewables also, too. I would imagine. Absolutely. I mean, one thing that's really interesting about too. Texas, we're a huge fossil fuel state, but we're also... The biggest um, renewables producer. We're number one in wind and number two in solar. People don't so. think about... It's amazing with Texas. They think, oh, yeah. ga oil and gas. Well, and and you yet you're the about, biggest renewables, although a lot of the renewable power is being used to power the refineries, for which is just... Yeah, exactly. Makes your head explode. Uh, or, so, or are you bullish now. on energy? Um... Uh, yes, yes, we are bullish on energy. I mean, obviously, energy transition is is occurring over the next several decades. But in the interim, uh, hydrocarbons are not are not going anywhere, um, and they they are absolutely necessary. And so, the best way to to if our viewers watching agree with you, agree with themselves, best way to invest is. Um, Owning pipelines? I, I would actually, yeah, so MLPs are very attractive and very interesting, uh, and that's how you, that's the primary way to own uh, own pipelines. Um, and then uh, to own the oil companies themselves, um, that's been tremendous. I mean, Warren Buffett just uh, revealed that he made a massive investment yep. in Chevron. That's something that, that uh, I, for one, would Made Mike Ward and CEO very happy, I'm yeah, sure, exactly, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. Uh, um, Renewable, you guys invest in renewables too as well? I'm sure. we, Yes, because as, if you know anything about energy, as you do, everybody wants to live in Texas now, have a giant home with a right. pool, 
Right. H- human energy consumption, run the air conditioning nine months a year. Right, the need exactly. for power is going to be unbelievable. Yeah. Of and all kinds. We need everything, right? Yeah, for sure. And so, yeah, no, I mean, Texas is really interesting. We're obviously based in Austin, Texas. Yep. Absolutely been Free fascinating. State of Austin. Yeah, absolutely been fascinating to see that growth. Yeah. Um, you the invested in crypto or are you like Buffett and Munger? They hate it. We are. We are going into crypto. Um, we uh, have spent the last uh, uh, two years actually studying the space and thinking about ways to, to go in. And um, we're primarily going in through the venture capital side. Okay. Investing um, in companies that invest in crypto? Yeah, that invest in crypto startups. Okay. Uh, so invest in the ecosystem. So you're not buying crypto directly. You'd, you'd rather put your money into a company that's going to build a model around a crypto. Correct. Uh, for example, Bitcoin is, is highly interesting uh, as an asset class to look at. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a lazy thing to say, a little bit of a rule of thumb. But whenever I hear the word Bitcoin, I substitute in my brain the word digital gold. Yep. Um, and so I think Bitcoin is is approaching that uh, uh, that ability to function as a as a digital gold. Uh, however, we've owned gold in our portfolio for a very long time. You know, at Texas gold. Teachers, real gold. Yeah, not in size, but we've owned it. And it's one of those things that's very difficult to fit into an asset allocation. You know, how to think about it. Uh, how does it does it react the way you want it to react when you need it to do that? Yeah. And so um, it's hard for us to put gold in our portfolio. It's it's also very hard for us to put digital gold in our. Because some people are like, well, I got if I own Bitcoin, I can't own gold. You're not. So you, you'll have both. I actually or think at least that exposure they, to. Yeah, I think that over time, as Bitcoin matures, uh, it will uh, those those two could have the potential to converge uh, and be thought of in much the same way. I do I do like that uh, that heuristic of a uh, digital gold. By the way, I don't know. I think the author's name is Nate Popper. Digital gold is the name of the book I read on the first book I read on Bitcoin. Interesting. Well, I was believe it was called digital. If some viewer out there, if I'm wrong, let me know. Uh, we don't talk a lot about international. Obviously, Europe's getting crushed with uh, yes. they had inflation before the war. Now their energy they're paying six x what we are. Yes. In some case, spot natural gas, electricity prices are at record highs. Their markets have been hammered. There's you know China's locking down. What's your worldview? Literally, are, are you buying equities? Yeah. Anywhere in the world? I mean, we have very large uh, equity allocations uh, globally in the emerging markets and in Europe, Japan. And, um, uh, you know, at, it, it's approaching a floor. It really is. Um, to the extent that, that you might think that the U.S. is asymmetric to the downside around the world, given current valuations, they may be asymmetric to the upside. So there's still risk there, but valuations have been have been have have dropped so yeah. much. Any markets you like more than others? Um, we like uh, uh, Europe, for sure. Even with what they're going through? Yeah, we do. We do. We, just because we think that the market has reacted uh, to what's happened. Uh, and when you look at the geopolitical situation, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to actually predict the outcome of a war. We have no idea where this is going to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But that, um, uh, you know, the moves that are happening on, on the lo- in the larger geopolitical are, 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 pr- are well, um, you know, telegraphed and, uh, you know, they haven't shut off natural gas totally. They've done it to Poland and Bulgaria. There yeah. was a very, very uh, um, considered strategy on the part of the Russians, um, you know, uh, as to what, how much gas is actually needed in yeah. those economies and things like that. Well, if they cut off flows altogether tomorrow, we got a whole different... Of course. There's yeah. some things you can't plan yes. for, yeah, equity I mean, wise. you would be into rationing. Uh, the German economy yeah. would need to But you're still going to buy European equities because maybe you think the market is predicting... A yeah, very bad outcome. The market is thinking in. more about those bad outcomes. We've had so. a couple of uh, the your colleagues are on this panel talk about uh, they love home builders. Got it. Yes. We're playing the demographic shift in the United States. Are you? Um, yes, we are. We are huge investors in single-family housing. You are. Both in the, yes, we are. Both in the public markets as well as the uh, as well as the private markets. Multifamily housing as well. Um, those have been very uh, strong contributors to our real estate portfolio. Our real estate portfolio had a twenty percent return last year. Wow. So and is that primarily a mix of residential, single family and multifamily? That portfolio is everything. So uh, office, industrial, yeah. Amazon warehouse. Because there's a lot. Listen, I, I live outside of New York. Uh, I don't know when the last time you were in Midtown Manhattan was. Not a lot of office workers have come back. Yeah. So real, I, No, but real concerns about defaults from big borrowers. So I am uh, yeah, understood, understand that. Uh, I, for one, you know, was in New York on 9-11. 
Uh, people talked so about New York never, never coming back, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and it, it certainly did. It came back bigger or better than ever. I think that the U.S. Opera office market is an opportunity right you now. You do. I do. I think that uh, everything will return in time, over time. Even New York. I do. I do. You I can't think, knock us down. I mean, you can knock us down. We're going to yeah, get back up. Exactly. Right? Um, you know, uh, the, the theme of this conference here today at Milken is the power of connection. Yep. Uh, I strongly believe in that. Um, I think that... Well, humans matter. I think humans getting together and actually speaking uh, is the incumbent um, and it will take a lot to knock that off yeah, off, off the pedestal. Anything you absolutely can't stand right now, Jace? Uh, asset wise. Just wouldn't touch with my money as little as that is. I mean, I, I can't stand. That's, that's strong. Uh, we, we want to end strong. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I think the way I would end is I would say uh, I think that, that people should have a little bit of cash. I think that there is um, uh, that, that the risks are tilted yeah. to the downside and that people should be uh, be prepared for that. Even though we've already experienced, again, that that, cor that correction in the S&P yep. 500 and that uh, bear market in NASDAQ. I love it. Digital gold, crypto, actual gold. Yeah. Uh, trimming a little bit U.S. equities, but still optimistic long term. Optimistic. For example, I'm in Austin, Texas. It's hard not to have very rosy glasses there. That's 600,000 people moving there every day. It feels yeah. Like. Ho home prices. Uh, Try to get a U-Haul from L.A. right here yeah, where we are to Austin. Exactly. Good luck. Home, home price is up 48%. Uh, the, the appraisals, the median appraisal in yeah. Austin, one year, 48%. Uh, California is certainly moving there, and we welcome them. It's, it's Jace a lot of Aubie, fun. Jace Texas Teachers Retirement System. Uh, real pleasure, Jace. Yeah, and absolutely, by the way, Brian. power of connections. For sure. Here we are. Humans matter. You flew in from New York. I flew in from Austin. We're Feels here. good, doesn't it? It does. Jace, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. You have a great day and a great conference. And folks, too. I want to thank everybody tuning in to the CNBC Pro live stream event. Whether you're watching right now live, thank you, or you're watching on replay. Either way, thank you for being a CNBC Pro subscriber. I am Brian Sullivan at the Milken Global Conference in Los Angeles. We'll see you again next time on CNBC Pro. Take care.